All righty. Next episode. Um, today, I'm joined by, she's going to say call her Cara, but I'm going to say Professor Cara Brenz for her introduction. So um, thank you for uh, coming on today. I'm really excited to talk to you today about your work, um, really kind of in a lot of in um, hydrogen production, but a lot of like in um, kind of on the, the verge of mm, like biochemistry, but also electrochemistry. It's kind of a lot, honestly. It's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of combined, so I look forward to it. But <clears throat> First is, you know, probably start with like a little bit of a background about yourself. I know you graduated from um, Carleton College, so I assume you kind of are from the Minneapolis area. I, that's my presumption, but I don't know if you want to enlighten us on that a little bit. Yeah, I, it's true. I am. I am from Minneapolis. Um, yeah. Grew up there, and I, I did go to Carleton because it was pretty close. Um, funny enough, though, it's a lot of people in Minneapolis and in Minnesota don't actually know Carleton. They know the other college that's in the same town, much better, St. Olaf. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how is, uh, I've never been up to Minneapolis. Um, so uh, how did you, how do you like describe it as like a city? Um, like a lot of things to do. Um, what's the culture like up there? Um, yeah, I'm kind of yeah, curious. Yeah, I mean, so it's, you know, quite an outdoorsy place. Mm. You know, there's a lot of lakes. It's really common um, to live on or near a lake. Um, so without that necessarily being so fancy to be a near lake. So a lot of people, you know, were, you know, involved in, you know, sports on the water and, you know, there, there's a lot of walking trails and that kind of thing. So in my neighborhood, um, there is a like, you know, a few blocks from my parents' house that we could just, you know, go swimming and fishing in. And then just off of that, there is a little, a uh, little pond that was quite sheltered that would freeze over really nicely in the winter for, for skating and pond hockey and stuff. So, um, a lot of people doing, you know, cross country skiing, a lot of people doing sort of all year biking, you know, put on the fat tires in the winter and, and bike. Oh. I was never into winter biking myself, yeah. but, um, I was more of a cross country year so a lot of you know a lot of outdoor stuff that goes on there um yeah. people embracing the change of seasons and all that um and then culturally um you know there's really you know uh you know excellent music culture um i mean i grew up during you know the you know 70s and 80s and prince coming into his own and oh, his wow. heyday i actually had some prince encounters growing up really <laughs> which, without realizing what a big was at the time, yeah. Wow. Because <laughs> he um cool. would go to the he'd go to the Dairy Queen that was right by my elementary school. And so he would sometimes be um seen there, you know, it's like, oh yeah, Pr Prince was getting dillies with Sheila E or whatever. So <laughs> what the? that's super um, cool. Wow. So that, <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, I've seen him in concert a few times and stuff there. So wow. so that was, you know, sort of I was always really into Prince growing up and I was yeah. growing up during his heyday. So um, you He's know, not in the Prince, you know, you know? So that it's kind like he was really huge there, of, of course. Yeah. Is he is he from Minneapolis? I didn't know that. Is he yeah, from he that? Is. Oh wow, okay, interesting. Um, on, what is okay? So what is cross country skiing though? Is that how is that different than like oh. skiing? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it is. Um, uh, so it is skiing, not necessarily downhills. Okay. <laughs> so skiing. You know, it, it can be, you know, on a flat surface, but you can go down and you can also go up hills on it. And the idea is, um, and I guess if you've only done downhill skiing or only heard of downhill skiing, it probably sounds kind of preposterous. Like what you're telling me, you're going to ski up hills. Yeah, it does. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, the skis are designed and wax in such a way that um, depending on how you distribute your weight, you can either have quite a bit of glide to go down hills or to sort of glide across a, the snow or you can get some grip to kind of climb up the hill to be able to go down another hill. Oh, wow, um, okay. And so that was a really popular activity there with, you know, the long and cold winters and a lot of snow. We just could ski right out our back door basically and, you know, go and ski across the, the lake and, you know, around. I did that almost every day with my dad uh, growing up. So, yeah. Um, yeah Must be great memories there. <laughs> um yeah i grew up i grew up in the uh the northeast of philadelphia so not quite as cold as say as minneapolis but we certainly get some cold days i don't think it's really cold enough to get like we never really had like we're able to get like 
Well, maybe actually, maybe I could be wrong, but like freeze a pond and go skate. I could be wrong on that though. I, I, I don't know. I, winter sports are not my thing. Um, I've been <laughs> water sports and winter sports are like not, I've been snowboarding once and it was like, uh, you know, I'll drink at the lodge. Like I have fun guys. Like I don't really <laughs> personally. Um, but I do love the change of seasons. I think it's pretty cool that you can ski during the winter or uh, skate during the winter and do all those activities. But then in the summer you're swimming in the pond. I think that's super, um, it really goes, um, yeah, be great, grateful, I guess, for that. Cause now I'm here in Texas and no one, no one gets, you don't really get that mm-hmm. kind of opportunities to do that. Um, that's no, really cool. No. Um, growing up though, um, how were, so apart from like your obviously activities, <laughs> but you know, were you always interested in let's say like chemistry or, or STEM fields or anything like that? Or how did that kind of get started before going into Carleton? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a good question. So I guess, I mean, so, I mean, one obvious influence, my, so my father who's no long retired now, um, was a middle school science teacher. Those are and the best so, jobs. I swear. <laughs> like middle school, high school teachers, <laughs> I swear are the best teachers or the best like jobs. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I think it's the hardest, <laughs> but maybe I middle mean, school. The Actually, best, maybe middle yeah, school. in some ways, but wow. <clears throat> managing managing kids at that age. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. <laughs> but uh yeah, he um so he taught primarily earth science. Um and I think he taught some life science, um, never chemistry. Um <clears throat> so I guess, you know, science was kind of always around growing up. Um and part of it is, you know, doing outdoors things is like in being out in nature. And then when, if I was with him, he was always pointing things out to me, you know, he could always, you know, identify birds and, you know, identify rocks and you just like pick up a rock and say, Oh, you know, this is a sedimentary rock. See those, see those layers in it. And, you know, talk about how that was formed. And I always thought that that kind of thing was really cool. I always really liked sort of observing what was around me and, you know, kind of taking it in and understanding it. I, you know, I think, from his influence or, you know, things like, you know, pointing out the planets at night and, you know, just sort of being aware of and, and understanding things. So I think I kind of had that gra- ingrained in me growing up, um, hanging really out special. with him. I mean, I, I mean, how many kids have a, you know, a, a guardian that can just knows general knowledge for like a, a, a little, like a little one. That's really, <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah. But so that's um, but actually, then, yeah, yeah beyond yeah, that, oh, okay. Oh, I was just going to say that um, my, I think, you know, my high school had, had really good, um, really good uh, teachers, really good mm. science teachers. I think that made a big uh, impact on, on what I did later. Um, my, um, remember my chemistry teacher in high school was really a character. He'd been in the Navy. He wore short sleeves year round to show off his his anchor tattoo. I mean, he like <laughs> he was like a like a cartoon character of a, and he had this like I don't know, just this presence and yeah. um and also the excitement about chemistry. He's a really memorable person. So um, I think you know, yeah, having good classes with with him and other science teachers in high school really made a difference. Certainly, a young like between middle school, high school, if you have like good teachers, um, they definitely will leave long lasting impressions. I know my chemistry and, and physics teachers did. So I definitely, I hear you there. Um, so mm-hmm. kind of going into, into Carleton, I mean, um, I know you, um, that w- wasn't like maybe the biggest school in your, near your, um, there was the other university, but, um, you know, where you initially, mm-hmm. did you go in as a chemistry major or, um, you know, how did that all transpire? Um, yeah. Um, so I guess I, I went in, I guess, pretty sure I wanted to go into science, um, mm. one of the science majors. So I, I considered really all of them. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, chemistry, I mean, part of it was, I guess, the professors I had, although they were really all excellent. Carleton was just amazing um, all around. Um, but I think in the end, chemistry, I really landed on, and this will sound cliche, but sort of, you know, as it being the central science, 
you know, that I really liked all of the sciences. And I felt like while chemistry touches on biology, it touches on physics, touches on geology. And, you know, if I sort of like all of those spaces, if I'm a chemist, then I can move in different directions or, you know, be involved in, in all those areas. And so it kind of felt like splitting the difference to me in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely hear you there. Um, I was never like in high school, I was never like a big fan of like biology, but now I certainly have appreciation for like, um, let's say like biochemistry and now they even have chemical biology. So I don't even really know the differences between these things anymore. You know, it's really starting to get really gray. Um, uh, so, but during your time there, I know you did a little bit of, um, I know you did a little bit of research and you did, did some research with, uh, professor Lynn Buffington. Um, who, so mm -hmm. what I'm curious about is, you know, how did you get initially interested in, uh, chemistry research had that had the opportunity arise and um, you know what did you do during your time there yeah so um, I guess I worked with Lynn my whole time there and um, she was doing NMR studies of carbohydrates and I guess I liked the idea of applying a physical method to a biological molecule um, and I felt like I would learn a lot of different things and I, the work that she was doing, I thought was interesting, trying to understand the details of the dynamics of these molecules and solution. And, um, so yeah, I, I joined her group and the Carlton has a great, I mean, I, I, I guess I don't know if they still have it. I assume they do, but when I was there, they had really excellent support for summer research. I think, you know, mo many chemistry majors stayed there for for research over the summer supported by the department, mm -hmm. I believe, or where, you know, as a student, you don't know where the money actually comes from. You just know, oh, they're paying me <laughs> to stay here for the summer. So I will. And so a lot of the chem majors stay. Yeah, I know it's a different perspective when you get older, yeah. but um, I, I think back like, gosh, where did they get that money? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, they, they supported, I mean, I think, uh, you know, a large number of us, um, and, you know, my class, we had 30 chemistry majors there at Carleton, you know, we're, oh, wow. you know, this is a school of 800 students. So that's a pretty you know, big a lot class of, then. Lot of, yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, I don't think atypical at Carleton, they really do great with chemistry there and, and have a mm. really good proportion of majors. And so, you know, we were good friends. We stayed there, you know, did research, um, played volleyball every night. Um, ended up with a great IM volleyball team in the end from all that practice, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was, uh, yeah, what was your team you know, name? it was just Hang really good there. What was your team name? Did you uh, have a good team name? Collisions. Okay. <laughs> I like that name. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, there's a lot of, uh, good chemistry puns for, for intramural sports teams. I, I've been noticing that. So I'm really curious when people yeah. have a team name. Um, that's really a cool <laughs> opportunity. I know. I know during my undergrad, um, I was, I had the opportunity of like doing a summer at my university that was paid for, like to stay in the, the mm -hmm. worms and like do summer research. And that was super fun. I was taking classes and doing research. Like it was super fun. Yeah. Um, I always cherish those, those oh, memories. Summer there. classes while doing research. Yeah. Cause I was originally in chemical engineering. So I was taking like, I was getting ready to like do co-op, but then the opportunity to mm -hmm. do chemistry research arise and. Um, as, as much as I am grateful for the chemical engineering department, I did learn a lot. Um, I was more interested in the more fundamentals and chemistry rather than the engineering applications. Um, mm -hmm. but for anyone yes. out there, if you had a chance, mm -hmm. especially if you're an undergrad, you get an opportunity to do like to stay or do chemical research and you're even mildly interested, I highly recommend. Um, anyway, so that's, that's mm -hmm. super cool. Um, I guess one question, one question I have is, is cause carbohydrates, um, they're kind of long chain, um, sugars, right. And starches. So, you know, how do you study that system in NMR? I feel like you get a really, uh, kind of messy spectrum though. Um, yeah. So we like, were actually just working with mono and disaccharides, okay. small, small ones. So those are pretty straightforward. And yeah. I assume you're just looking to see how things <laughs> folded, I guess, or, um, yeah, we were looking things? at like how the, you know, conformational puckering and, um, intramolecular hydrogen bonding affected were, were related to each other. So these were, um, you know, sugars with some amines on them and, you know, interested in how 
you know, you can, you know, deduce uh, hydrogen exchange rates and how that relates to different interactions within the, the molecule. Something that always fascinates me is the strength of a hydrogen bond, like, especially like biologically, like it doesn't, it doesn't seem like, I mean, you think about that like covalent bond versus like hydrogen bonding, but like hydrogen bonding really is like the, a lot of like the, the backbone of a lot of like chemical processes, which I mm-hmm. think, I think it's really, I think it's really cool. Um, mm-hmm. But so at your time at, uh, uh, at after uh, Carleton, um, I know then you, well, went to go do a PhD at, at uh, Caltech, which is certainly a, uh, um, uh, a very cool step in the, the graduate life direction. Um, but how did you kind of come to that decision and then um, to like pursue a PhD? And also what I'm curious about is, you know, how, uh, you know, the change was, you know, moving from Minneapolis over to uh, Pasadena, which I believe is just outside of LA. Hopefully I have that right. But anyway. Yeah, it is. It's sort of a, I guess, an inner suburb of LA. It's actually a pretty short drive to downtown LA from Pasadena. Um, but yeah, so... You know, um, one of my professors at Carleton, um, Marion Cass, um, who is a bioinorganic professor there, she actually sort of recommended Caltech. And I just remember a number of us were talking with her about grad school choices. And, you know, she said, you know, none of our students for a while have gone to Caltech in recent years. And it's just, she said, I think our students are a little bit scared of moving to L.A., (laughs) but it's such a nice school. You, I just want you to go and, and, and check it out. And so, you know, her recommendation certainly affected me and, you know, maybe I would have applied there anyway, but I definitely applied there with her encouragement. Um, and then I looked at a few other West coast schools and, you know, a lot of, uh, a number of the bigger schools in the Midwest. And I don't think I applied to any schools, out east. I think I decided if I was going to be moving away from where I'd grown up, I had just made the decision I would go west rather than east. Um, and there were lots of good schools. But now you're east anyway. In the west, so. Yeah. You're in the east now anyway, sir. So. <laughs> Not east anyway. So yeah, exactly. You know. But hmm. um but yeah, when I visited Caltech, I just I just had such a great visit. You know, I met Harry Gray, who became my future research advisor, of course, and, you know, Jackie Barton. Um you know, I, I felt like I would be happy working with either of them. And the students there just seemed, you know, really, you know, happy and excited about their work. And, you know, the other thing, too, is it's a smaller school than a, a lot of other schools. And mm. so I think for me, there was a sort of, um, you know, in a way, a feeling of familiarity coming from a smaller school myself. Yeah. Um, it just, you know, it was kind of a more intimate, friendly environment compared yeah. to some really big places. And I think that that for me made a difference too. No, I hear you there. I mean, my undergraduate is like, I think it was like 3,500, 4,000 undergrads. So I definitely hear you where, once you have that kind of experience, it's hard to like, why would you go to a big university? Um, so mm-hmm. I definitely I definitely hear you there. Um, wh- I guess, um, you know, but to get to, how did you come to the decision of like going to graduate school? Like, was it kind of a progressive thing? Maybe like, I don't know, you weren't interested uh, in going to industry yet yeah. or. Yeah, that's, um, yeah. So I, you know, I was really enjoying chemistry. I knew I wanted to continue with it in some way. Um, I wanted to learn more. And so the logical choice was graduate school. Fair I guess enough. I did consider, um, medical school a little bit as kind of the other obvious thing that students with uh, science training might do if they want to continue on to some sort of further development. But I really, you know, I ruled that out pretty quickly. And I just, yeah, I don't know. And I I, I guess I wasn't sure, didn't know for sure, you know, which way I would want to go with my career, but I felt that getting my PhD was a reasonable next step (laughs) that could get me going in a number of different directions. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, no, I yeah. hear you. I, I, uh, I never like had a dream of going to graduate school, but like when I, when I was like junior, senior year time and it was like, okay, I was looking for industry jobs. It didn't really feel right yet. So I was like, what else is there to do? And mm-hmm. I talked to my mm-hmm. advisor and they were like, well, graduate school is always an option. And I didn't know it was paid for, at least in chemistry, like they do pay you to go to graduate yeah. school. So I didn't know that. And like, unlike a lot of other degrees and especially humanities, like you got to pay for it, but no, and, 
and at least in, at least in chemistry it's paid for. So that's super nice as well. Um, how did your, uh, had your, had your, uh, like parents handle it? I mean, you were leaving Minneapolis and you're going out to, to LA. You were making the big trip, not pursue mm-hmm. music. You were pursuing chemistry, um, or acting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, uh, they were supportive. They were okay. really pretty laid back, um, in terms of supporting what I wanted to do. Um, I remember Fair my enough. dad saying, when I told him I wanted to go to grad school, he says, oh, he said, great. He said, I was worried you'd want to be a doctor. And I, <laughs> I, th- I think you're too smart. I think yeah. you should be <laughs> continuing with science. Wow. <laughs> so but they, but he never really pushed me one way. It was, but once I made the decision, he was like, yeah, that's the right decision. <laughs> wow. So, uh, and then, um, yeah, I mean, making the transition out there, I actually, you know, road tripped it out with my mom. And oh, that's super um, fun. yeah, I packed up the car uh, with everything we could and drove across country, um, stayed in a couple places. And then I, I still won't ever forget driving into Pasadena, <clears throat> driving in on the 210 and looking for the turnoff to Caltech. And it was so smoggy. We could hardly see the signs. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just, it's just, and I remember my mom saying, it's like, oh, I don't know about this place. You know? <laughs> just, you know, we've just never seen air like that before. But yeah, um, but yeah it all, yeah. It's it all worked well. out though. How was the, um, yeah. I mean, obviously the weather is different, but like when you, after maybe a couple of years there, um, you know, you know, what were some of those major differences? I mean, obviously the weather's gonna be different, obviously, but I mean, like, um, like overall, like how, like the differences between like Minneapolis and LA, anything kind of stick out to you? Yeah, I mean, the, um, the, the cultural diversity and, you know, the composition of the population were really different. Mm. Um, I mean, Minneapolis has become more diverse over the years, but when I, was growing up there in the seventies, it was really not so diverse. Um, and you know, so there were a lot of, you know, people from a lot of different countries and different cultures in the LA area. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, really enjoyed meeting a lot of different people from all over and with different experiences. So that was great. Um, but, you know, to me, I mean, kind of everything there seemed different, <laughs> you know, it's just a totally different landscape, different climate. Um, but the people's yeah, that's attitude, just one of the Were people's attitude different? Like, as much like laid um, back? I mean, I mean, I would say that Minneapolis is a pretty laid back place and okay. so is LA. And I think I was sort of, I mean, I think this is one of the reasons I went west rather than east, right? Is I didn't want to go to a place that I thought was going to have an intense feeling to it. I yeah, wanted to yeah. be in a more like that place. And so I, I still kind of felt that, um, you know, so maybe, it, you know, it wasn't super different in, in that way. But, um, you know, people are, you know, pretty friendly. And, yeah. you know, I got to meet a lot of my neighbors and chat with people. And it was, you know, kind of Midwestern in that way, too, at least to me. Mm-hmm. So as your time in Caltech, you know, I know you eventually you joined uh, Prof- uh, Professor Harry Gray, um, and you know you were looking at like uh, at least you know engineering cytochromes um, with uh, you know ligand binding properties. I guess the first question is, you know, why did you join um, his lab, and uh, you know what was kind of your your research project you were doing your time there? Yeah. So. Um... You know, I met Harry during my prospective student visit, mm. um, of course, the year, the you know, spring before I, I went to Caltech and I met him with a group of students and I don't remember how many of their uh, were six or eight or something. And he, um, we went around and we all said our names and what we're interested in and where we're from. Then in the fall, when I went to Caltech, I ran into Harry just by the chemistry building and he remembered me and he remembered everything about me from that encounter. And he's, this it's not, I'm not special. He, this is him with everybody. He says, Cara, how are you doing? 
He said, you must be so excited that the twins are in the World Series. Because <laughs> he remembered, you know, that I was from Minneapolis and he made that connection with, with the World Series and everything. And I was just like, wow. And I mean, that's not the reason I joined his group, but that was sort of my first impression of him getting on campus was, you know, his amazing, you know, memory um, for people and, you know, right. his appreciation for people. And that showed me that he really did listen to students and pay attention. And so I, I thought that that was great. Um, but also, you know, I, I looked at a number of groups and I was especially excited about the science in his group. I really liked the, <clears throat> the idea of studying um, metals in biological systems, I thought really gave the opportunity to learn some biochemistry, um, but also apply some physical techniques. And it just seemed like a really fascinating area that could go a lot of different directions. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a, that's a super cool experience. I know I was talking a few episodes ago, we we're talking about like kind of like group culture. And I feel like when you get that kind of connection, like when your professor remembers like little details like that, I mean, mm -hmm. you, you know, you got to feel like a superstar for sure. Right. So, um, which is, I, so I think that's, that's really cool. You had that, um, connection really. And, uh, kudos to professor gray. Um, cause mm -hmm. I certainly, um, you know, we always meet a lot of people and I try to, I try to remember people. I try to do my due diligence to kind of remember certain things. Um, cause it does brighten people's day, uh, when you remember stuff about them. So, yeah, that's but, for sure. Um, yeah. you know, so do so you were looking at um you might want to explain um i don't know your your thesis i kind of let you kind of and then you you go with that uh sure so yeah in my thesis work i took this um electron transfer protein hmm. cytochrome c and made a mutation in it um basically swapped out the so that it has a heme in it with hmm. two axial ligands imidazole donating uh, um, group histidine on the bottom. And then on the top, there's methionine, which has a thioether. So we mutated the methionine with alanine, which just has a methyl group. And so that opens up a ligand binding site. And so my thesis work was actually making that mutant a few different ways. And at the time, technically, that was actually quite difficult. So, you know, now you, you, that's something that you would do, you know, in a couple of days or a week. But <laughs> there, there are a number of technical difficulties actually with that particular system because of how it's matured in the cells and everything that um, made that special at the time to be able to do. And then once we had that mutant um, looked at how you know, how it binds oxygen. So then it kind of acts sort of like hemoglobin or myoglobin, um, except it was very different <laughs> in a lot of ways. It, um, in terms of the rate of ligand binding and the strength of ligand binding. And so that allowed us <clears throat> to use that system in order to learn some very fundamentals about how the structure of the protein impacts, um, you know, interactions right at the metal active site. Um, so I did, you know, some, you know, laser flash photolysis studies. Um, I did a lot of studies of electronic structure, EPR. Um, I did uh, paramagnetic NMR over in, in Florence with Ivano Bertini on the system. Um, so it was, you know, a lot of physical characterization of it. Yeah, I was gonna, that was gonna be one of the next things I asked you is the opportunity to go do um, University of Florence. I'm sure that was a, well, summer in Italy, two summers in a row sounds super fun. <laughs> um, well, how did it, so how did that opportunity arise? Like to be able to, um, do a visiting student, um, over at the university of Florence. Yeah. So Ivano Bertini and Harry were, you know, had known each other going way back. So Ivano had worked with Harry, um, many, you know, a few de decades before, and that was really what got, Ivano going sort of on the direction of, of metalloproteins, mm. um, I believe. And so he was visiting and he had learned about this um, particular protein I was working on and its properties. And he just proposed to Harry, he said, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting system and it would be a great sort of test system for some methods that we're working on developing right now for NMR studies of paramagnetic um, proteins. And so they just agreed to send me over to, to work on that. So, wow. um, 
yeah, I was really lucky <laughs> to, to be part of that for sure. Uh, so I know while you're there, um, what I'm curious about is you're doing, you know, paramagnetic heme proteins. So I guess, I guess that's a bit special. So for those who like aren't really chemistry, um, paramagnetic species to do NMR, it means it's very difficult. Basically, it means you don't really get any good signals because um, there's no uh, magnetic moments for you to pick up on in the, in the instrument. So how did that work physically? Like what, what were you like probing for? Um, yeah. So the, what you can see in these systems, it depends a lot on the details of the electronic structure. Hmm. Um, so in uh, these particular systems, we actually could really get good high resolution spectra. Okay. But you would have some of your lines would be broader than narrow than usual. And you would also have a lot of really unusual chemical shifts. So, you know, that's sort of one of our primary measures in proton NMR, usually between minus one and 12, roughly. But we would, in this system, we got shifts down to, you know, minus 30 and plus 40. Um, and that's because the, um, yeah, paramagnetic means you have this unpaired electron. So, and it can interact then with the nuclear spins and it causes these unusual shifts. So it's like having a little magnet in your sample within this system that you're studying with a magnet. And so it's, you know, really interfering with things and shifting things around in unusual ways. So um, we, uh, so what Ivano's um, uh, um, innovation here was, was to, um, to, um, actually use that effect to say, okay, well, we have all this shifting. Um, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. The shifting depends upon the electronic structure and also the molecular structure. And so let's put those together and actually use that in order to find a way to determine structures in a better way mm. uh, to get higher resolution. And so the methods that he developed on that are, you know, still very much used today where people will actually sometimes put paramagnetic tags onto proteins to make them paramagnetic and then use those kinds of effects in order to better refine their structures. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Um, when you're over there in Florence, um, you know, I assume you, I see you did a lot of research, uh, but you know, any uh, activities and hobbies over there or. You know? Yeah. Well, traveling. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. Florence obviously had a ton to see. Right. And, I was really lucky um, at the time, the lab there was was right in the center of the old city. And mm. I was living also in the center. So every day going to and from the lab, I would walk across the center of, of Florence near all of the big landmarks there. Um, and so I got to see a lot of Florence wandering around there. And then on the weekends, every weekend I would pick a different uh, city or, or village to go to. And, um, Sometimes I wouldn't even really plan it. I would just, I was actually staying pretty close to the train station. I would like, I would go into the train station and see where everything was going. And then I would pull out my guidebook, right? Cause at the time that was what we had. Um, and say, okay, let's, I'll, I'll go to that place and yeah. um, go and check it out for, for the day. Um, That's crazy. And it was, yeah, it, it was really great. So I, I got to, yeah, I toured a lot of the towns in Tuscany and Umbria that are pretty close. And then I did a couple longer weekend trips, like, you know, down to Naples and up to, to Venice. That's super awesome. What an opportunity. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> it um, was. I mean, I know. It's just, I was, you know, really right place, right time. Um, that, that's what to, you need. To get to have that that opportunity. It was really, and the another interesting thing being there was the actual lab there was in this very old chapel. Yeah. Um, there were these old frescoes on the walls. Um, so you had these, you know, big, you know, uh, you know, 600 megahertz NMRs, you know, underneath a, a fresco of a skeleton, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it was just a really cool environment. I, sadly, I don't have any photos of the lab. I don't think I was not smart enough to take any pictures. It's... And that's really a shame. I hope they exist out there. It was a really interesting environment. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's always one for the, for your own. I guess, memories, I guess you're really in the moment. So you can't really beat that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no. <laughs> what I'm curious about is during your time, either in Florence or both at, um, you know, Caltech, um, I'm sure it wasn't all fine and dandy. I was kind of curious if you had any like really struggles, like with your science, like, was there, like, I'm sure it was not these, these 
this uh, this research does not really sound easy on the surface. As someone who understands this, this doesn't really mm -hmm. sound too easy. Um, so was there like what I'm curious to know is was there maybe because a lot of stuff doesn't work in the beginning. Some people get lucky. Some you know it starts working, but it's a lot of sludge and it's a lot of like working hard and um, working with the fine details. But was there kind of a moment where like something clicked and it finally started working, or was it kind of just a, a gradual progression over time? Yeah, I mean, you know, with this particular project, I think I was really lucky to work with some great mentors who taught me how to do stuff and who we worked stuff out together. So, you know, there were, yeah, I mean, there were times that, you know, getting our proteins to express, you know, we would get really, really low yields and we ended up having to do, you know, like 200 liter batches of cell growth in order to get, you know, enough sample for our NMR experiments, which, you know, we actually requires to be fair, quite a bit of a protein, Jeez. Um, but, you know, managing that, I mean, I wouldn't say that was really a problem. It was, that was just kind of how it was at that time with the system. So it wasn't that unexpected, but it was difficult. Um, I actually had to, in order to do those big batches, we didn't have the facilities at Caltech. So we would do the initial growth there and then I'd load all the cell culture into the back of my car and drive all the way across LA to UCLA, which is like an hour drive or more in traffic mm. and drop them off there at their cell culture facility um, and hoping that I didn't spill anything or contaminate anything on the way. So it was kind of, it was kind of a crazy process overall. And if anything got contaminated at any point, you know, it was all ruined. So Oof. it, what it really required was good teamwork. I just, I had such great mentors. Um, I had, when I first started, Debbie Woodkey was my mentor and mm -hmm. she's now a professor at Colorado. Mm -hmm. And then uh, later, Elu was my mentor, um, taught me a lot of the molecular biology work and he's a professor um, now at, at UC Austin. And, um, you know, we just, we worked together and, you know, solve problems together and reached out to each other, you know, when, when there are issues. So I mm -hmm. think, you know, that that's really how we got through. I think that that's uh really makes for a good, great team environment. Right. I mean, um, I guess it just sounds like you're like good, like group culture, honestly. I mean, um, between your professors and, you know, your mentors, I mean, um, that sounds like really, really awesome. Um, what were like, what were some of your like favorite moments? I mean, not like, um, I, I, within the lab, like, do you recall any really cool moments? Yeah. Oh, um, I mean, you know, we had a lot of it was a lot know, of like gatherings the little things. and celebrations. Yeah, I was going to say, a lot of like the little things. Yeah. Yeah, I hear that. Every Friday, we had an inorganic talk that all of the inorganic groups organized. Mm -hmm. And after that, um, we would have the Beckman Institute social hour that Harry sponsored. And he'd get a couple of kegs and other drinks and put them out in the Beckman Institute courtyard, which was just next to the chemistry building. And then, you know, so all the inorganic groups after our talks, we would all gather there for more discussion and, you know, and it was open to everybody. So, uh, just sort of those informal gatherings, um, there was they really a culture way. there of meeting people across different groups and different areas. And that really had a big influence on me and, um, just got to, you know, I, I think just all those informal and friendly interactions, it, it mm. was, you know, made a huge difference. I can't, I would not have gotten through grad school if we were in a situation where it was really like our group was really isolated and people didn't cooperate right. and help each other. Um, I can't imagine doing it in, in that way, but the way it was yeah. there, it was supportive. <laughs> So after you did, um, after you were at uh, Caltech, um, you know, you, you did a postdoc uh, over at really not too, well, actually, I actually don't even know where UC Davis is. I got to be completely honest. It's like, <laughs> I don't even know where it is. Uh, my, uh, my geography of California is not like the best other than like LA and San Francisco. Um, yeah. But you worked with Professor Gerd Lamar. Um, yeah. So was the postdoc a natural progression? Because at this point, you know, when people go to the postdocs, maybe the job market isn't quite lined up right maybe you want to be a professor so that's you know or um honestly the idea of a postdoc sounds more and more appealing every day i think because you can kind of mm -hmm. basically go wherever you want and do like just some cool science um, more or less i know it's, that's not exactly it but mm -hmm. you know um but anyway yeah so was the postdoc kind of a natural progression or 
was that kind of, do you have to give that kind of a lot of thought? Um, I mean, I think by the time I was well underway at Caltech, I was thinking that I wanted to go into academics. So, mm -hmm. you know, postdoc was really the next, the next step and a chance to, to learn more. So, um, yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, Davis is, um, it's actually near Sacramento or, okay. you know, not, not that far from, from San Francisco. So. Yeah. Way up there. And what were you doing um, uh, over at that, that lab? So I was on continuing work on NMR of paramagnetic proteins, um, but I switched to working on iron sulfur cluster proteins. Okay. Those are, uh, um, those, those sound quite difficult to, uh, um, <laughs> to, to do, I guess. Um, um, I know iron, I work in, um, iron catalysis and they can be quite a hassle to study. Yeah. Um, you know, but we have so much, so much of it on the earth's crust, so we may as well try it. So maybe it'll work. <laughs> um, <Yeah>, definitely. <laughs> um, but, um, during your time, um, during your postdoc or at least after your postdoc, um, the, uh, the opportunity, I guess, arose for you to go uh, become a professor. So was that kind of, at what point you were like, you know what, I want to be a professor? Like what, like, um, when did that kind of yeah, arise I think, for you? you know, while I was at Caltech, um, okay, Caltech, I think, you know, I just really had a great experience there. And, you know, I was starting to have some ideas and I thought I'd like to try try some of this out <laughs> and, you know, I'd like to try to set up a lab and see if any of this will work. And I figured, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was kind of scary and intimidating thinking about doing that, but I figured, well, you know, if it doesn't work out, then I'll do something different. <laughs> you know, it's people don't always, don't necessarily stay in one job their whole lives. Although that's kind of what I've, what I've done now since then, but you know, that's the exception, not the rule. And so my thought was, oh, I'll, I'll give it a try. I have ideas. I want to see them through and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, now you are, you know, the department chair at the University of Rochester. Um, I assume you applied to a, a bunch of schools and I guess Rochester, um, I don't know, probably gave you the greatest package. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it was great. Um, Rochester, for those who don't know, it's mm, Northwest New York, I think. Rochester, no, I'm thinking about, yeah, like Northwest New York. Um, so yep. definitely, uh, the climate's definitely closer to Minneapolis. Um, like kind of that it's kind of that environment. Um, but you do really a lot of cool projects now. So definitely want to, let's hop into that a little bit now. Um, the one, the one project, um, well, I know you kind of do, you kind of do, you have two different projects going on. Both of them are in, let's say hydrogen evolution or production, um, in kind of two different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, one is using, um, let's say like biological nanosystem, um, and like photochemistry, um, using this like cadmium selenium, like, uh, <coughs> quantum mm -hmm. or cadmium selenium, like quantum dots. I'm going to be honest. I don't really know what that means. So I'm, I'm very curious. To, <laughs> I'm really excited to hear, you know, uh, you know, you explain that, but also you can also make it from, you can also take water, um, with cobalt and with cobalt catalysts, um, biomolecular catalysts, and you also can produce a uh, hydrogen. I guess, um, one question I have though, is like, you know, why, why are we interested in making H2? Like I generally, I, I don't really know why maybe at a more fundamental level. It's, it's really interesting. Like uh, at the fundamental levels, it's, it's, it's interesting for sure. But, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't, I don't really know how important hydrogen is. Um, and then, I guess just kind of overall explain those, those projects. I think they're super interesting. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so H2, um, arguably the simplest molecule, <laughs> right? So, um, from a fundamental standpoint, studying, I, I, you kind of look at it as it's the study of the assembly of two electrons and two protons. Mm, okay. And, you know, it's so it's, it's a really simple system yet, you know, when you have those four things you're bringing together <laughs> mechanistically, it's tractable, but still complicated enough to be interesting. Yeah. So I, I think things that we've learned from those projects are, you know, some fundamental things about proton transfers and 
in um, catalysis in water and that kind of thing. So it's interesting fundamentally. And so and that's broadly applicable, of course, too. But in terms of sort of, you know, why H2 otherwise, um, I mean, so hydrogen is a very um, uh, energy dense fuel, you know, by weight, you know, by volume, not so much because it's a gas, um, but it's, you know, combustion product is only water. And so it's really an excellent carbon free fuel. Um, so there's interest in using it in um, for as a fuel for a lot of different applications. Sounds um, great for funding. This last part, I, I'm sorry. Sounds great for funding. <laughs> yes. So yeah it, yeah, it definitely. I mean, and and so the Department of Energy has had a big uh, push in um, H2. I mean, actually starting back in the mid. 2000s, there was kind of an initial push. Yeah. And then things kind of switched over to CO2 and now it's more back to H2. But um, yeah, it's definitely a, a fuel of interest by the Department of Energy. Um, it's, um, you know, you know, there's some practical issues with it, but I, um, you know, there it's are- It's not for you to kind of, it's not for you to like deal with. No, I no, guess, so yeah. I'm really more on the fundamental side. And, you know, I don't really, yeah, look at the engineering. Um, but I, I did have dinner with a, a former student in my lab just last night, who was in town from California. And she told me that she bought a, a hydrogen car out there in California. <laughs> really? She has a hydrogen fuel cell car. So she's really walking the walk <laughs> or, or driving Respect the drive. Um, yeah. And, um, I don't it's, think it's the you know, details the, 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 on that. The challenge of finding the fueling stations, but she said pretty much it's working, and I, I was super impressed. With that. I, I am. I would love to know the details of that car. That does not sound safe, but hey, what do I know? <laughs> actually, I mean to walk the walk though. They're actually doing it. They're actually contributing to mm -hmm. a greener. Um, but okay, that's really cool. Um, yeah. Let's dive into like how these systems work though. That's what I'm really curious about. Um, mm -hmm. So especially like, um, well, I guess the, the first one, these, the, 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 the bio nanosystems, right? So um, you have, you have a biological component, I assume you have a photochemical component and then you have these quantum and then you have these cadmium selenium components. So how do these all mm -hmm. kind of come together for you to make hydrogen, like, let's say, to shuttle around some electrons to make hydrogen? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I have no, I don't even yeah, know what quantum so, dots mean. So like, <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll explain that. Yeah. So yeah, the idea with, with these systems, these are artificial photosynthesis. Um, and so, yeah, basically the components that you need for this are you need, you need light. That's the source of energy. You need something that absorbs the light. That's easy. And those are the quantum dots, it turns out. Okay. Um, then you need a catalyst that's going to um, assemble protons and electrons to make H2. That's also the quantum dot. Okay. Um, but then you also need a source of electrons. And in our system, that turns out that that's the food that the bacteria eat. That's then delivered okay. to the quantum dots. Um, so the way the system works is that the cadmium selenide quantum dots are, so they're, you know, a few nanometer size crystalline cadmium selenide, which is sem a semiconductor. But when you make the, um, the cadmium selenide um, in a nanocrystalline form, it becomes what's called quantum confined. Um, the wave function extends outside of the space. And so the... Um, the size of the quantum dot um, determines your your homo lumo gap or your conduction band valence band gap. Okay. So you can tune the wavelength of light and also the energy that you can then you know uh, store in these systems by the size of the quantum dot. And so this okay. is work that my my collaborator Todd Krauss is really the expert on this, and he contributes all of this. So he first developed quantum dots as photocatalysts for hydrogen production um, based on that. How'd you come, ac um, come across so, this, like, real quick? Like, how did you... How did we come across this? Yeah, like, how did you come across this, I guess, idea? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, that's kind of a story, too. So so my collaborator, Todd, he, so he developed the quantum dots. Okay. Um, I was sort of only... I was not directly involved in that. I was just sort of peripheral. It was part of a project we were on together, but it was his part of it. Um you know, where 
you know, there is a long tradition of using molecules to do this kind of chemistry. You can excite the molecule with light put into an excited state, and then the excited state is competent for doing catalysis of, you know, hydrogen production or something. But molecules fall apart pretty quickly if you, you know, do too many photochemical cycles with them. Okay. But the quantum dots are quite robust. And so that's where Todd got, said, you know, let's use the quantum dots for this. And that, that worked really well. But the big problem with that system is he was having to run those, those experiments in like up to one molar ascorbic acid as oh. an electron donor. Mm. Uh, because that electron donation step to the quantum dot is really the slow step of the process. Um, so we needed a better source of electrons. All right. And this okay. is a big problem. And this is a collaborative project. We got funding together on, and we talked for a long time, how are we going to supply electrons in a more reasonable way? Cause you actually would get more energy out of the system by burning the ascorbic acid than you've seen it as an electron donor. So, um, so then, so go back many years in 2002, uh, I, uh, saw a paper published that reported the genome of this organism called Schuonella uh, um, onodensis. Okay. And it caught my attention for a couple reasons. One is that it was isolated from Lake Oneida, which is near Syracuse, not too far from here. And secondly, this um, organism was reported to have a record number of cytochrome genes in it at the time with 39. Okay. And I thought that was really cool because at the time I was studying cytochromes and how cytochromes are assembled. And um, <clears throat> it was kind of amazing that they could make that many because it's very biochemically expensive. So it turns out that they use these for electron transfer. So when these bacteria eat their food, you know, just like when we eat our food, you end up with electrons that you put somewhere. Um, we put our electrons onto O2 and make water. These bacteria under anaerobic conditions can put their electrons onto a number of different extracellular substrates, you know, like metal oxides or metal ions out in solution. Whoa. And I thought, wow, that's a really cool, really cool organism. And I kind of had it in my head. I would love to somehow do some science with these. <laughs> so then when Todd and I were talking about how are we going to get electrons to quantum dots, I said, let's try this crazy organism, Schuonella. They do this extracellular respiration, and maybe if we pair them with the quantum dots, they can provide the electrons. So they're respiring the quantum dots. And so then the um, source of the electrons becomes what the bacteria eat, which is lactate. And lactate is very abundant in waste streams, so there's sort of a practical um, uh, um, aspect to it that's, that's attractive. And so, yeah, so that's how, really how all that came together. So really, literally decades in the making. <laughs> that is super cool. So let me kind of let me break this down a little bit. So you so lactate is eaten by these by this organism, the Shawanella um mm -hmm. onedensis, that's the bacteria. Mm -hmm. So that the bacteria eats the lactate. I don't know, do you understand the mechanism so it, it's able to take the lactate and basically produce electrons. And that gets So it, it yeah, it oxidizes it, you know, down okay. to CO2 eventually. And then <clears throat> yeah. That okay. gives off electrons. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. And it dumps these electrons. Well, I don't know if you understand where it goes in this, in the, it goes into somewhere in the cell, but you, you but you could capture those electrons basically and put those into the cadmium sel selenide. Um, yeah. So they site. actually, they, so this is where the cytochromes come in to play. So the outside of the cell is decorated with these cytochromes, which are electron transfer proteins. Oh, okay. Okay. And so the electrons are transferred out of the cell through the string of cytochromes and then to the quantum dot. Okay. That, okay. Now, how does this like look in practice though? Like, do you have a, like a, like a dish with these bacteria, you line them with the, with the electron transporter that are connected to these nanocrystals? Is that like, so basically, I mean, we, all we do is we culture the bacteria in the presence mm -hmm. of the quantum dots. We have it in little vials and we culture it over LED lights. We have the whole thing temperature controlled and it all shakes. And um, so in some ways, it's really a very simple system. We just put the components together in that way and and let it grow. That's super cool. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a super cool um, way to do that. What's, what's kind of like been um, 
wh- where are you kind of where are you guys at with this project now? Because um, I know you kind of do that. Like, I know you guys focus mostly on the culturing the bacteria, um, and kind of monitoring the H two production. But I'm kind of curious to know like where um, this could be taken next, or um, if you guys are still trying to understand like mechanisms or stuff like that. Yeah, so we have a lot of directions planned. And actually, one thing that I'll say is it took us years and years to get the system to work. I mean, yeah. it's really been a lesson. I'm sure. In, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, do it. It's, it's a very simple system, but getting it to work consistently was just a nightmare. And we came so close to giving up many times. So I guess the message I would give is if you really are excited about it and believe in it, um, try not to give up at some point, some point, maybe you have to, but we, you know, I'm glad we did it on this one. Yeah. But, you know, going forward, we really want to understand the system better. Um, and we want to also optimize it. So we're optimizing all the different components so that right. bacteria can be genetically engineered to enhance or actually, or decrease their extracellular electron transfer abilities. So we're collaborating with Ann Meyer in biology here at Rochester, um, who's doing genetic engineering on the bacteria to you know, play with their electron transport mechanisms. Mm-hmm. And then we're measuring um, their electron transferring ability and also then how that affects hydrogen production. Wouldn't you want to do dioxide. more though? Like, wouldn't you want more production though? Or does it, is it kind of, yeah, so I guess from a, more, I guess from a fundamental understanding, the, I guess from a fundamental understanding yeah. you want, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, we'll knock something out and then see, you know, if hydrogen drops way down, then that tells us something about its importance. Right. Okay. So I see. Um, and it's easier often to knock something out than to make it run better. And so if we knock something out and it really drops, to pro- um, production, then that tells us that it's worth putting in the work to trying to enhance it further. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's um, that's the biology side, and then on the nanocrystal side, um, Todd Krause's group is um, so these nanocrystals. In order to keep them suspended in water, you have to have ligands on the surface, and so they're you know changing the ligands on these to see how that affects interactions and, and activity. Um, changing the size of the quantum dots. At some point, we'll change the composition. And um, and then there's other aspects, like all of the different components in the solution we use to grow the bacteria can also affect the catalysis itself. Hmm. And so we're trying to pull apart all of those different components. You know, for example, you know, how much cobalt we have in solution can affect the catalysis by the quantum dot side, and it can also affect possibly the growth of the bacteria. So if we change the cobalt concentration, how does that affect all these different things? Interesting. So we have a, a collaborator doing artificial intelligence um, analysis of the system to try to pull those things out. It's um, Andrew White in chemical engineering here at, at wow. Rochester. This is a huge project. <laughs> um, I'm <laughs> super excited to see where, where this goes. Um, one last thing about it is how do you like actually monitor the H2 production? Like, how do you know, like how much you're making? That's some, I, I don't quite follow. Like, how can you like, per, like percent yield of like hydrogen gas? You know what I mean? Or the yeah, turnovers, so how do you do that? Yeah, we just do it in sealed containers and we analyze it by gas chromatography. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Wow. That's really yeah. cool. Well, I'm excited to see this, this, this project flourish. This is, <laughs> this is super cool, especially from like a fun, fundamental uh, perspective. Um, Mm-hmm. Kind of in the same vein on the oh wait so is this is this also in in collaboration with the the cobalt too so this is both the are these two different projects or are they kind of in the same um, they're two different projects but okay. from what the other project what we know about the role of cobalt where that's informing us on okay we have to think about what you know cobalt and other metals are doing in the shoe and oh uh, okay system. okay okay um, but I know you also do um, you know. CO2 reduction using cobalt, um, which mm-hmm. is um, very interesting um, because for non-chemists, CO2 reduction is um, quite difficult. Um, it is not an easy thing to reduce. However, if we could figure out a way to reduce it, um, that would be extremely helpful. Um, or, and you could kind of bring it back to more um, more desirable feedstocks, let's say, if you could reduce CO2. Um, so. Um, how did you come across, I mean, obviously, I mean, I feel like a lot of scientists are interested in CO2 reduction, like at least on the surface, like, of course, like what scientists wouldn't want to be able to figure that out. Um, but, you know, so how did you kind of get interested in that project um, and um, kind of explain it um, a little bit in, in some detail? Yeah, so um, it really 
came out of our hydrogen project. So mm -hmm. whenever, when you reduce CO2, um, you start with CO2 and you have to include electrons and protons to get any products because you have to protonate that second oxygen, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, just like even if you're making CO, for example, which is what we've been making so far, which is the easiest product. Um, but that means then you're always competing with combining electrons and protons to make H2. And so the challenge then with making CO2, and especially we do all of this in water, so there's always a lot of protons around. The challenge is enhancing that CO2 reduction reaction and suppressing that proton reduction reaction to get good selectivity. Mm. And my group had been doing a lot of studies of understanding the proton side of this, and we had gotten some insights into ways that we can enhance and decrease the proton reduction. And so we thought kind of a good system to try to apply that to, aside from just <clears throat> improving hydrogen production itself, was a CO2 reduction system. So can we take what we've learned and adjust the conditions so that we can get higher selectivity for the CO2 reduction reaction. Hey, yeah, that's really, um, and I see, I, I noticed that like when you have, um, like a low pKa buffer, you can kind of get high hydrogen production. And when you have a high pKa buffer, you get CO production. So are you, mm -hmm. are you kind of interested in like the mechanisms of, you're just kind of understanding this, I guess, in general, um, yeah. So, you know, at, at first we're, you know, that's our mechanistic hy hypothesis and <clears throat> we applied it, you know, to, to show that, that change in selectivity. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that change really, you know, sort of supports that, that mechanistic model, but mm -hmm. yeah, we're, you know, that's basically what we're interested in. Um, you know, next steps is, you know, we have these biocatalysts that do this and we're interested in, you know, understanding more sort of the details of the biomolecule structure and how that impacts the selectivity. So we have some, you know, different studies we're working on with that. So for example, one of our hypotheses is with the biomolecule that has a more hydrophobic top, um, you know, active site, mm -hmm. does that help to um, uh, bind the CO2 and increase our selectivity? Um, okay. Because CO2 is hydrophobic. Um, so, you know, th so those are some additional directions. Yeah. Type. What, so, so far, I mean, I don't know if you know this off the, top, off the top of your head, but like so far, like what is, what have you noticed to be the best, um, the best system for CO, like carbon monoxide production from CO2? Like what's like the best? Um, in like, general? Well, for there? like, you, for like your systems, like, let's say like cobalt, oh, for our the general scheme of the ligands and like P, uh, PKA. Um, I don't know if there's light involved. Yeah. So or volts. Yeah. In, electricity. in general, um, we're getting good activity where we use somewhat modest potentials. We do this by electrochemistry. We put in electrons at a given potential. If we go to very, very negative potentials, so that's more and more energy, we get more H2. But if we back that off a little get, bit, we get less H2 and more CO. And that's mm. related to the mechanism of the reaction. So if we combine that with having a less acidic proton donor, which also decreases H2 production, that combination then gives us good uh, CO production. Okay. And we also are seeing some evidence that having a more hydrophobic active site can help with CO production. Okay. Too. So can we, uh, are we able to kind of dive into that mechanism a little bit? So how does, let's say you're at a, um, I guess it'd be a low, it'd be a less negative voltage. Um, how does that in turn make more um, carbon monoxide? And in addition to that, I guess that would be um, higher pKa, so a, a, a better bronsted acid. Do I have that right, or do I have it backwards? Um, so yeah, lower pKa would be a better bronsted acid. Oh yeah, right? I have it backwards. So okay. yeah, that's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, so I can tell you what, what our model is. We don't mm. have, you know, we haven't trapped any of these intermediates. Fair um, enough, I'm I'd sure it's very difficult. That. It's really, really hard in water, but I can tell you sort of what our, what's, you know, all of our data are consistent with the model where we start out with cobalt three, um, we reduce it to cobalt two, that, and cobalt two is really kind of the starting point. Cobalt three is sort of like the pre-catalyst. 
but then we reduce can reduce that further to cobalt one. So once you make cobalt one, cobalt one is very nucleophilic. Mm. And if you have any protons around, they're going to want to combine with that to make a cobalt three hydride. And once you have that hydride, then you're quite likely to go around the cycle um, to result in hydrogen production, where you can protonate that hydride ultimately and release H2. Mm. But you have to go to quite a negative potential in order to make cobalt one. So if you don't go that far so that you never directly make cobalt one, what our proposed mechanism is, is that we can bind the CO2 and also reduce the, um, the metal uh, to sort of a cobalt one state, but while the, the CO2 actually binds to the metal. Okay. And um, so we never have just a cobalt one sitting around, um, which would make the hydride and make H2. Instead, we make the cobalt, reduced cobalt with the CO2 bound to it. Then once that happens, you can avoid making that cobalt hydride that gives you H2. And instead mm. then go down to breaking down the, the CO2. That's really cool. Um, uh, it's good to see um, you're able to, and you know, it, it's, it's really good to see we're able to actually like, reduce co2 i think it's super cool i'm really excited to see kind of how this the, the next steps of, of that and hopefully you're um well you're able to get different feedstocks so i mean you're if you're able to make carbon monoxide and h2 if you can if you can get 100 percent carbon mm -hmm. monoxide 100 percent uh, hydrogen that'd be really fascinating i think um so hopefully that yep. comes in the future the other you know the last project i know you guys do is kind of nitrate and nitrate reduction with iron complexes so mm -hmm. um i'm pretty familiar with iron i know this 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 uh, this um this metal um is extremely desirable to do a lot of these things, especially a lot of bioactive um, um mm -hmm. catalytic systems. But um, you know why nitrates and nit nitrates and nitrates? Like I don't even know. Um, I don't even really know what they are. Honestly, I don't even know <laughs> <laughs> um, why they would be of interest. I guess. But I guess I guess now that I think about it, I guess if you can make them into more valuable feedstocks, so why, why wouldn't you? Um, but yeah. So how, yeah, how'd yeah, you kind of come across the project? Yeah. yeah um, so um, because I've always been really interested in the nitrogen cycle in general because it involves a lot of metalloenzymes, mm. involves a lot of redox state changes. Um, it's, I always thought it was kind of fascinating chemistry. Um, so we, <laughs> one of our proton reduction catalysts that we developed, which is a cobalt metallopeptide, we noticed that it was binding phosphate in solution. And so that made us think, well, maybe it could bind some of these nitrogen oxides and do chemistry with them. So that was mm. our first nitrogen reducing catalyst, uh, nitrite reducing catalyst was that um, uh, uh, cobalt peptide. Um, and then, you know, that got me sort of interested in that area and thinking about developing other catalysts. And it was my colleague, Ellen Matson who had noticed this iron um, catalyst that was reported for CO2 reduction. And uh, Ellen mentioned, she said, hey, you, you know, you all should try this uh, catalyst for your nitrite because I bet it'll work. And, and it did, so that was Ellen's suggestion. <laughs> and um, at that point then from our other work, we had sort of gotten our feet underneath us and how to do the chemistry on the system. And so, um, so that was our next step on that. So. Yeah. And we're still developing these these systems too um, on different substrates and understanding them better. But that was kind of just getting our feet wet in that area. Yeah. That's really cool. So how do, do you, I mean, I'm sure you're still figuring this out, but like what's the general mechanism of these things? Uh, the nitrate, nitrate just binds to the iron center and then um, it gets reduced. I don't really, how does that system kind of yeah. work? Yeah, so it's a, <clears throat> you know, multi-electron, multi-proton reduction. Yeah. Um, so it's it's very complicated. We we think Fair that enough. we go through intermediate <laughs> involving uh, intermediate of nitric oxide NO. Okay. Um, but yeah, we, yeah, we don't really probably... have much mechanistic information. That's okay. Um, I yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it's I'm sure these systems are not easy at all. Uh, I, I I hear you there. Um, especially are they? I assume like they're also paramagnetic species. Like I I just assume they are. Um. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. I'm sure. I'm sure it's also not easy to go crystals at all. If I don't even think that's probably not even possible, but <laughs> yeah, we, there's a crystal structure of, okay. um, 
the iron catalyst that okay. we have. So that that helps. Well, capturing those intermediates are definitely a, I'm sure, yeah. next to impossible. <laughs> but I hear you there. Okay, well, I was just curious. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> yeah, um, but kind of as we wrap up here, what I'm curious to know um, is kind of as your general time as being um, kind of a mentor, really, an advisor is um, what has been kind of like some of the most rewarding experiences so far um, for you, you think? Yeah, I mean, just seeing the graduates of my lab go on and do really great things. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, in industry, academia, um, other directions, and, you know, especially seeing them find careers that they really enjoy and that they feel fulfilled in. And I, I also love seeing students learn the skills that they gain in our lab in so many different ways, you know, you know, with, you know, writing, editing, you know, actually researcher in a lab. Um, I have a student who got a job at Intel because of his electrochemistry experience. I have a student who's a former, these are former students, a graduate who's working um, at, uh, at, at Bausch and Loam doing uh, in their pharmaceutical division doing organic synthesis, which is sort of like the one, the one thing my lab doesn't do, but his experience <laughs> with my lab, they felt he had the skills in order to, to, to do that. And he's doing well there. And I, I just, I get really kind of a thrill out of seeing the diversity of things that graduates from my lab are, are able to go on and, and do. And I think it just really speaks to just the, the broad value of, of education and PhD training. You know, it's, you learn specific things in your thesis work and in your research, but in the end, the most important thing is really learning how to learn, learning how to analyze things and how to think. And, you know, if you do that, then you can really go on and do anything. Yeah. That's a, that's extremely good point. Um, cause yeah, I mean, your, your thesis is extremely important and you should be, and you should be an expert in it. But the skills you learn along the way can really be transferable to a lot of different fields, um, which is definitely a uh, a gift that I feel like a lot of um, other like fields just don't really have. I feel like there's just so much like hands on transferable or even like comp computational skills. I mean, um, that you can learn during a PhD, especially in chemistry. Yeah, um, that's really cool. Good to hear. Well, well, Kara, I want to thank you so much for uh, coming onto the podcast. It was extremely um, fun talking with you today and really excited to see your, you know, your future work um, that comes out of all your projects. Really looking forward to it. Well, thanks Aiden. This was fun. Really Alrighty nice guys. To meet you. I'll see you next time.